Oh, that was weak. Let me do that again. <laughs> there we go. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the May 23rd, 2022 uh, Mayor and Council Work Session. Tonight, we have one topic for discussion. We're going to be receiving an update from our partners in Montgomery County on the Maryland 355 BRT project. But before we get to that, uh, we for those of you who didn't realize it, uh, we had a book festival this weekend, and it was a enormous uh, giant success and I wanted to take just a couple minutes uh, to say a few words of thanks uh, about and appreciation about the book festival and I'm I'm going to read from a post that I, I put on Facebook this morning um, in order for our book festival to be as epic and amazing as it was yesterday so many millions of things had to come together so many people had to do had jobs to do uh, large and small, paid and unpaid, so many authors, poets, workshop leaders, introducers, exhibitors, booksellers, vendors, sponsors, and performers had to show up. Uh, and it's amazing, like we refer to it in the singular, but the book festival is really like a hundred events that happen in an eight hour period. So um, I wanted to thank everybody who uh, planned, executed, participated in and or attended the 2022 Gaithersburg Book Festival. Um, as a matter of background, our book festival may be the most grassroots book event in the nation. It's the only one that I know of that's fully put on by a community. Most are organized by booksellers, universities, media outlets, or larger governments like state governments. And because of that, every aspect of our festival is infused with the DNA of our Gaithersburg and surrounding Montgomery County community. Yesterday, we delivered an outstanding cultural event for everyone in the region in a beautiful setting, organized like clockwork. It's a statement of what a community can uh, build and present to the world. And it was a proud day for all of us, and I love our community. And I want to, I want to particularly, since we're here uh, at a city meeting, I want to particularly call out all of our staff. Um, there were people who were involved. Obviously, this is led by our Parks, Recreation, and Culture Department uh, and our regional events team, um, and the lead planner on the festivals, Carolyn Crosby, and and um, she works under Shelley Williams, and she works hand in hand with Jenny Cottrell, and they're. They play the lead, but every single department, I saw uh, people at the festival uh, participating, helping, making it, making it what it is. And we could not do it without the buy-in of all the people up here at the dais, and we could not do it without without the the buy-in of our of our staff. And I hope everybody shares in the pride for for what we did. And I I am uh, tremendously, profoundly grateful uh, to everybody who participated. So I wanted to put that out there. Uh, does and while we're at it, does anybody want to say a, say a word before we move forward about the book festival, Denisha? Thank you, Mayor. I just as my first in person uh, book festival, I want to say I am in awe of the effort, um, the the seamless way in which staff and volunteers came together to put on really a massive event under you know, some interesting conditions. <laughs> um, and, and it was really, I, I, am, I am truly proud to be affiliated with such a hardworking uh, professional group that are able to, to pull off something like this. I heard, um, you know, unsolicited feedback from folks uh, participating at how well done it was. I was standing in line to check in at the tent to get my introducer badge behind a couple of authors who said, oh, this is fantastic. We've never been to something so organized. Uh, this is our first time here, and it, this is amazing. Thank you for doing this. And, you know, from those kinds of comments to uh, the laughter of kids and, and just all, everything that happened, all the joy I saw yesterday, and to know that our staff um, plays a, a tremendous role in making that happen for the community, and I, I couldn't be more proud of them. Thank you, Tisha. Yeah, I'd like to add one thing is that, you know, it's not uncommon for members of the public to let us know when things aren't right. But I'll tell you, not, a large number of people during the course of the event to, came up to me to say, please share with the staff and the city and the committee what a great event this is, how, how 
incredibly well organized it is and how much they value this event as part of our city. So I wanted to pass that along. It's really, people were looking for people to thank for the event. That's awesome. All right, um, unless anybody else, okay. I'm not seeing anybody raring to go. So um, uh, let's move on to our discussion topic and I will turn it over to uh, Rob Robinson from Planning Code. Uh, thank you and good evening, Mayor Ashman and members of the council. I'm pleased to introduce tonight uh, Joanna Conklin and Corey Pitts from Montgomery County who are here to brief the council on an update on the 355 BRT. Uh, the city's been a long advocate for this transit line and the council was last briefed by these folks in 2019 as they were developing the alternatives analysis and finalizing. Um, since then, through a pandemic, they've achieved 25% design and are moving forward with that. So it was a good time, again, to bring the count, uh, our friends in today uh, to update the council. So with that, I'll turn it over to Corey. Welcome. Thank you, Rob. Mayor and council. Uh, so these are the topics we'll go over. We'll go over just a very quick overview and recap. I see some faces that weren't on uh, the council uh, when we last came to you in 2019. Then we'll walk through kind of where the project currently sits. Um, we just wrapped up or are wrapping up our budget and phasing process as part of our uh, capital improvements project budget. I'll talk about some of the design updates, touch very briefly on uh, the Lake Forest Mall and Transit Center, because um, that was a topic of discussion back in 2019 as well, where we're going in terms of public outreach and the next steps. Um, so in terms of the purpose of the project, we're trying to provide an improved transit service that provides greater travel speed and frequency along the Maryland 355 corridor. And there's a number of objectives that this project's trying to achieve in, ter in terms of improving mobility, uh, improving safety, expanding ridership and opportunities, supporting redevelopment and growth along the corridor. The project's really trying to achieve a number of objectives. Uh, if you recall uh, from back in 2019, uh, the project goes from Bethesda all the way up into Clarksburg. Uh, we are focused on seven discrete design segments, and these are really based on the characteristics of the 355 corridor. And I'll focus in on segments four, five, and six, because those are the ones that land within the city limits. Um, so we are at uh, the 25% design milestone, as Rob mentioned, and we're working towards the 35% milestone, which is the end of what we call preliminary engineering, and we hope to reach that milestone later this year. Um, through the county's budgeting process, uh, we're currently considering, or actually really we have considered, funding for planning, design, and construction of not just this BRT corridor, but other BRT corridors in the county. Um, So we are at preliminary engineering. We hope to wrap that up by the end of this calendar year, early next year, uh, and then move into final design, which we anticipate funding will get uh, ultimately approved. It's gone through the reconciliation process, and we don't see any issues with the funding that's being proposed for the project. Uh, final design will last another couple of years, and then construction, again, anticipated for funding of a phase, which I'll touch on uh, here briefly. Uh, would start in 2025 and last for roughly three years with the start of s the first service in 2028. Throughout all of this process, there'll be uh, continued public engagement with our corridor advisory committee, as well as the, our stakeholders, such as yourselves and the public at large. So in terms of the capital budget and the project phasing, so we anticipate as part of the county's capital budget uh, funding for final design of the entire project. So that would be the 22 miles from Bethesda to Clarksburg. The project gets phased when we start talking about construction. So uh, the central phase has funding identified for final design and construction. That phase goes roughly from Montgomery College in Rockville up to Montgomery College in Germantown. So that would include all of the portions within the city of Gaithersburg. Uh, the north and south phases um, are funded for final design. As I mentioned, the entire project is funded for final design, but there wasn't enough construction funding identified to fund the construction of the south and northern phases. So we're continuing to look for funding opportunities to support those two phases and to get them advanced as quickly as we can. But right now the focus is on trying to get that central phase through design and into construction as quickly as we can. 
So in terms of the design update, uh, following our update with you back in 2019, which called for a primarily median dedicated BRT, uh, going through segments four, five, and six, uh, as a single median lane, uh, the feedback that we heard uh, from city staff and the council uh, was that the, the impacts in segment five, which is kind of the segment from Summit Avenue to roughly Maryland 124, Montgomery Village Avenue, were just too extreme uh, for the, the single median lane. So we've reverted that back to a mixed traffic segment. So in segment four, you'll have a single uh, bi-directional median BRT lane running through the middle of Maryland 355. As we come up to Summit Avenue, that would transition into mixed traffic. And then as we come back out the other side of the city, uh, north of Montgomery Village Avenue, we would transition back into the single bi-directional median BRT lane and then up towards segment seven. And you can see some rough images of what that would look like. So the single median lane would be separated from traffic the mixed traffic means that the bus operates with all the other vehicles traveling along the roadway corridor. The station design is also moving forward. Uh, the station design is very closely mirrored uh, to the US 29 flash stations, which are currently operational for about over a year now. Uh, there have been some minor design tweaks that I'll point out. Uh, the station marker, which is the tall blue structure, has been pulled out of the station canopies. The, the original concept had it nested as part of the canopy and we learned that during construction, it's a really difficult piece to try and get all those three components uh, to get to fit together <coughs> perfectly, accounting for construction constraints and tolerances. So we've pulled the marker out so that those tolerances don't need to be as tight. Uh, we've redesigned the marker so that not all of the electronics would be embedded in it. They'll be embedded in a different screen located under the station canopies. Uh, and in terms of all the other improvements, they're generally the same. We're looking at larger canopies based on feedback that we've received on the US 29 service to provide more coverage of the station platform, as well as providing more opportunities for seating. So this is what a station would look like. This is in a specific location along the corridor at the median located locations. And then in the, in the locations where the bus would be running in the curb lane, so this would be the mixed traffic segments, uh, and we do have a, a one segment of curb running BRT. The stations would be located on the side of the road, so pedestrians would pass either through the station or around the back of the station, depending on how much space is available. But the stations themselves would look the same. We're also updating our service plan or how the buses would actually operate and serve the corridor based on the focus on the central phase. Uh, so the, the full plan for the full 24 miles includes a collection of four routes. Uh, this central phase would only include uh, three initial routes as part of that. So there would be the initial routes that would start up in the Germantown area, one likely starting around the milestone parking ride, the other likely starting at the Germantown Transit Center, and then both of those routes would make their way to Lake Forest, uh, where the three routes would convene. The third route would start at Lake Forest and then travel uh, the remainder of the corridor down to Montgomery College, where it would terminate, and the other two routes would terminate at Shady Grove, where we expect the, the lion's share of the ridership coming out of the north to terminate and transfer to the metro. The routes themselves would operate on very high frequencies and where they overlap, that frequency gets even greater, uh, coming down to a, a frequency as, as quick or as short as three minutes where all three routes would overlap. If you recall from the last update that we gave back in 2019, uh, we had the route going around Lake Forest Mall uh, via Lost Knife Road so that it can make the connection to the Lake Forest Transit Center. The Lake Forest Transit Center is very important as a transit hub and we wanted to make that connection. However, as we continue to study that and look at it as well as uh, review the feedback that we received from, from the community, that diversion off of the 355, the 355 corridor was just proving to be too great. It was adding a lot of travel time for the people that were traveling through the area 
works great for the people who are just destined for the transit center, but if you're, if you're traveling either beyond it to the north or beyond it to the south, it add a lot of trip diversion to your trip um, and would impact ridership. So we've now re reoriented the route to go up Russell Avenue. Um, and as such, uh, would desire a relocation of the Lake Forest Transit Center, which is called for in the master plan. We have developed just one concept. Uh, this is a concept that we would like to work with uh, the owner of the mall site, as well as city staff and other stakeholders in the area to find a suitable location and design that would fit and integrate in with the development or redevelopment of the mall. But this is just one concept of how that could be achieved and suit the routing uh, that we're currently proposing along Russell Avenue. As I mentioned, we would like to see it integrated in with the redevelopment of the mall, and there's a number of ways that this can be achieved. And these are just a couple of examples of transit centers and other locations that do a really great job of integrating in with the surrounding redevelopment or development. We're also getting ready to do a very large public outreach uh, effort uh, throughout the end of this month and the month of June, uh, which is why we wanted to come to you and give you all an update before we get too far into that. Uh, we've got over a dozen in-person pop-up events scheduled at locations along the corridor. So these aren't traditional meetings in a, a single space where we hope a lot of people will come visit us, but we're actually going to go out into the community to some of the major shopping centers, transit centers, farmers markets and other locations along the corridor uh, and meet where people are. So we've got 12 locations along the corridor, four of which are located within the city uh, where we'll hope to hear feedback on the project. Uh, we've also got four uh, scheduled virtual events. So these will be virtual meetings where we'll have people that can maybe no, either don't want to attend in person or can't attend in purpose, person uh, come and meet with us virtually, uh, view presentation materials, and engage with staff and ask questions. And then in addition to that, we're doing uh, something kind of new for us, uh, kind of phone office hours. So two days a week, Mondays and Wednesdays throughout most of the month of June, we'll have someone staffing a phone uh, and people can call in and ask questions or talk about the project and leave comments that way as well. So a lot of opportunities to get the word out or collect feedback. Uh, we've also got a survey that just went live today, um, so we're hoping lots of people will engage with us through the survey and leave comments and feedback. Uh, I'll just note that there is a chance to win a $50 gift card. Uh, we'll do a random drawing out of the people that decide to leave their contact information through that, so hopefully that will entice more people to participate because we really do want that feedback as we move towards the 35% design. So next steps, uh, the county's capital budget uh, is almost fully adopted. We expect that to be adopted by the end of this month, uh, but we don't anticipate any further changes in what I talked about and touched on in terms of the BRT budget for 355. Uh, the public and stakeholder engagement will go through the month of June, uh, and then once we wrap that up, we'll start digesting that and looking at how that will influence the design going forward. Uh, the big milestone is completing that 35% design milestone by the end of this year um, and then continuing with public and stakeholder engagement at that 35% design milestone and into the final design efforts. Uh, if you need to get in touch with anyone on the project, our project manager couldn't uh, be here tonight. She's actually just left for a, a much deserved vacation, uh, but you can contact her or myself if you have any follow-up questions and there is the project website, which will have all the updated materials as well as the survey. Thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation, the update. Um, as people who followed this body know and, and the project know, we've been, uh, we've, we regard this project as important and we've been very supportive. And, you know, years ago we put money into our own study of how to get through the choke points over at Father, Father Cuddy Bridge and elsewhere uh, because it is important to the city um, and so we're it's I think it's really good news that there's the funding's there to, to get us potentially through design and construction um, the issue uh, I see that that'll have to be worked out and to some degree will be out of our hands will be how the, the potential relocation of the transit center 
and working with the new owner of Lake Forest Mall property. Uh, our, as you guys I'm sure know, um, our recently revised master plan for the property does contemplate the relocation. And, um, and so we've sort of set the table for this negotiation and uh, we'll be interested to see a way uh, that you know if, if the county and the uh, property owner can work out an optimal way to to get that done and find something that works for everybody, um, that would be great. But we'll you know there's it's, some of it's just sort of out of our hands, and we'll we'll try to facilitate as we can. I think I I, I feel like I'm um, capturing where our council and staff would be on that. Um, so that's that's the one point I, I want to open it up for council members who'd like to speak on it. Go ahead, Ryan, and then Jim. I'm just going to take my mask off just for a minute to make some comments. Um, I'll echo everything that I think the mayor said very well. Thank you for your presentation and for your work on this project. Um, I think we're all pretty aware that transit is a pretty heavily uh, utilized uh, mode of travel in Montgomery County generally. Um, certainly. Um, you know, not on the measure of cars as Council Member Harris uh, has uh, discussed with us many times, but particularly when we're talking about um, the emphasis on equity and the em equity emphasis areas uh, that, have, that uh, uh, planners have been focused on of late, I do think it's important to acknowledge that the communities around this, tran this particular transit center location um, uh, reflect uh, particularly disadvantaged uh, historically disadvantaged segments of our community that rely um, disproportionately heavily uh, on transit and so we need to take that into consideration I think when we are uh, discussing the plans for this particular center uh, which I think is you know is an absolutely key stop um, uh, it's, it's currently a key stop on the I think the busiest ride on bus route in the county and will be a key stop uh, for the flash uh, system and um, I, I believe it's the third highest of the stops along uh, the corridor behind Rockville and Shady Grove metro stations. So, I mean, think about that. When you think about our entire county and the route, um, how important, uh, you know, a node this is uh, in our transit uh, plans and infrastructure. And uh, the mayor already talked about how our revised master plan already reflects a desire from the city uh, to appropriately relocate uh, the transit center so that we can gain those efficiencies uh, through the flash uh, system and through I guess the flash is now what we're calling BRT right mm -hmm. um, and through our you know our other uh, bus centered uh, transit systems uh, along 355 um, but I just wanted to <coughs> make that point about the equity emphasis areas because I don't want that to get lost in the conversation of the technical aspects of you know whether the transit center is going to be moved and you know, all these other uh, aspects of uh, the design phase. And I also just wanted to take a minute to thank the county um, and uh, the county executive and, and, and the administration for the significant investment here. I mean, we shouldn't let it get lost in the shuffle that $400 million is on the table and presumably will be approved uh, in this year's budget uh, for this project over the next, what, six years. That is an extremely significant investment uh, in this transit system. And um, so I, I think I speak for all of us when I say we're appreciative of that and looking forward to working together with the county, with the property owner, with the other stakeholders on these uh, community meeting phases that are coming up um, and really trying to come to a cooperative uh, solution on how we can maximize the location of the center, the investment, um, in um, a new transit center and really make sure that this flash system is successful. So thanks. We'll go to Jim. Thank you, Mary. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I am one of the new faces up here, obviously. Um, so for people who maybe aren't as familiar with the kind of the history of the project, I've been following it to a point, but uh, there are definitely some of the finer details that, um, that I am not as familiar with. Um, Will the, the flash be similar to um, the, the extra program that's currently operating on uh, 355 limited stops, um, those kinds of things? So I guess in terms of kind of thinking it as a tier, this would be a tier above the extra service. Um, so yes, limited stops 
uh, and transit signal priority, which the extra does bring to the corridor. So the transit signal priority helps the, the bus progress along the corridor by stealing seconds at intersections, either holding a green light a little bit longer or advancing a red signal to green sooner so that the bus can continue moving along the corridor. In addition to that, the dedicated lanes will be something that the extra service doesn't have. So that'll be the bus moving along the corridor without the impacts of congestion where we have those dedicated lanes. So the dedicated lanes aren't everywhere, but there are segments where it'll have its own dedicated lane. Um, Off-board fare collection, so pulling that fare activity off of the bus itself will help speed up the boarding process and allow people to get on the bus through really any door along the bus, whereas currently everyone has to queue up in a world where we collect fares. I know that we're not collecting fares during the pandemic, but prior to the pandemic when we collected fares, Everyone had to queue up at the front door and, and interact with the fare box. This way the bus will pull up, all the doors will open, people will exit the bus, people will board the bus, and the bus will be on its way. So it's, it's many different things that go together to make for a speedier and a more reliable service. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and this may be uh, premature at this 25% design stage, but in considering uh, the transitions between the different segments. So for example, from uh, segment five, uh, where it won't be a dedicated lane up to Summit Avenue, which is right outside City Hall, transitioning to uh, the dedicated lane. Uh, how is that transition expected to work? Um, particularly thinking about here, where uh, you'll have uh, Summit Avenue, you'll have the churches, you'll have the high school, you'll have the new Wawa, just thinking about how does the the bus get from the far right into that uh, that middle lane? So ideally, those those transitions would happen at a signalized intersection, so that we can then kind of advance signal the bus. So you know, if it's approaching the intersection and it's red, it would get its own dedicated advance signal to then jump into the lane. Some of the other things that we're looking at are kind of slip lanes, much like you have on kind of a highway, but it would allow the bus to kind of get into and out of. The dedicated guideway and those would happen prior to intersections as well so that by the time it reaches the intersection it can progress through the intersection so those are definitely details that now that we're in kind of the design phase of the project we're working through how that works um, so that that works seamlessly so that those don't become bottlenecks for the bus or for traffic we don't want to also mess up the existing traffic patterns that happen along the corridor we're trying to make this as seamless uh, something that we thread, you know, a needle through the, the corridor. Thank you. That, that's definitely one of my concerns. You know, it's obviously an important addition to our transit options, but uh, that corridor is a challenge already with uh, vehicle traffic, and uh, the thought of it getting worse because of this is definitely scary. So I'm glad to hear that you're thinking about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Jim. We'll go to Lisa. Thank you, Mayor. Um, nice to meet you, and I am the other new face <laughs> that wasn't here in 2019. Um, I thank you for the presentation, and I also want to say thank you for the outward approach to public outreach. Um, the in-person piece where you're going to go out, um, I, I view it as imperative that the public is involved and are heard um, and, and actually know what's going on so that, so that they can make comment and and really focus on what is happening and going to happen. Um, just a question, what led you to, to doing the outreach that way? So when we thought back to how we did outreach the last time we did a, a major push, we did kind of traditional open houses. We scheduled, I think, two or three along the corridor at various locations. I think one of them was up here at Borough Park near the high school. and there's a lot of effort that goes into that. We, we spend lots of staff time creating boards and materials and presentations. And what we've found is that we're not really getting huge turnout. I mean, evening meetings are difficult for people's schedules. I have kids, you know, it's just difficult to kind of fit that into everyone's busy life. So this way we tried to do kind of more of a, a tiered approach so that there are many different ways that we engage and that people can engage with us um, so that people can kind of choose what works best for them. Uh, during the pandemic, we definitely transitioned to a completely virtual uh, 
form of engagement and we found that that actually introduced us to new people that we hadn't been engaging with previously because now I can sit in the comfort of my home and you know engage with someone through a screen and if my kids are running crazy in the background or you know if I need to pay attention to dinner like I haven't had to carve out an hour or two hours of my evening to attend this meeting I can kind of try and slot it in so that's really what guided the approach was trying to find you know strategic ways to get at the people um, through as many different ways as we can some of those virtual meetings we're actually going to hold during the middle of the day so again not just a traditional evening type meeting but something in the middle of the day so that perhaps a shift worker who works that evening shift can now engage with us say for a noon type meeting I, thank you for that thoughtfulness and and i'd be interested to know the outcome particularly weighing it against how you've done it in the past sure thank you all right, we'll go to Neil. So a couple of questions. First of all, how are things going with the Route 29 BRT? It's been in place for a, a little while now. I'm just curious, since it's not in our neighborhood, I have no real data on how things are going with it. Is it get, gaining the ridership? Is it achieving the goals that you've set out? So it's definitely growing ridership. I would say you know it hasn't met the opening day projections, but those projections were made under a world where we didn't have COVID. So it's, it's not surprising that we haven't met those. But what I will say is that for a route that we started during a pandemic, it's been a pretty successful route. Like it's competing with some of the other top routes in the county already. And that was without a heavy marketing push because we, we held back on that just because of the pandemic and some of the other challenges that it's faced. The feedback that we've received from the people who are using the service has been extremely positive in terms of how they feel the service is working for them and what it's providing. Um, so all indicators are that it's been very positive and hopefully, you know, as things return to some kind of sense of normalcy, we will see that ridership continue to move up the way that we've seen it from the start. So is it, do you see it increasing the number of people that are using transit versus other modes versus automobiles? at this point that's a difficult question for us to answer at this stage um, you know I, I anticipate that as things start to get back to normal we'll probably do some more structured surveys to understand who's riding it right now we're just kind of doing straight counts of you know who's getting on and off the bus but not a real targeted ridership survey to understand like who's riding it why they're riding it and how they've changed their travel patterns yeah, deciding to launch this during a pandemic was probably not optimal for getting that kind of data, I understand. Thank you. Um, so uh, on a different note, um, we've had some feedback from the, uh, from the new owner of the Lake Forest property regarding the conversations they've had with your organization about the trend needs for the transit center. What is it that exactly that you're looking for aside from where it's going to be? Are you looking for a bigger transit center or different? set up than what's currently existing? So the current transit center is actually under capacity, or I'm sorry, over capacity. Mm -hmm. um, there was a study done uh, before I came to the county, probably five years ago, that determined that we needed more base space with the existing transit center. Um, so that we know with no flash, this transit center is undersized. Layering in the flash service, there is a need for additional bay capacity at the transit center. Um, and then in terms of location, as I mentioned, the current routing that was proposed back in 2019, carrying the bus all the way around Lost Knife, really added quite a bit of time to the flash route. So there's a desire to pull that transit center closer to 355 to reduce the diversion and better facilitate those transfers. So those are, are the two primary drivers of why we're looking for a relocated and a, a slightly larger facility than what currently exists on the street today. All right, thank you. All right, um, our colleague Rob Wu uh, texted me that he's, he's watching from home and wants to participate via Zoom and I see him on the Zoom. So tech team, if you could bring up Rob, that would be great. Rob, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, Rob Wu, um, usually reside in that seat between Council Member Harrison and City Manager Briley. Um, just want to say 
thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight for Corey for his presentation. I wouldn't have been there in person, but for a plumbing issue that happened right as I was heading out the door, as they always happen. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I think a lot of my questions were answered uh, by my colleagues. One, one question I do have is, you know, with respect to Section 5 and going into mixed lane traffic, one of the benefits that I think from a BRT and the structure of BRT is kind of the ability to remake the streetscape. And so the area north of Cuddy Bridge through, you know, Odin Hall or, or, or Montgomery Village Avenue, it, it's, as Councilmember McNulty mentioned, it's, it's trying for traffic. It's also trying for pedestrians. And so if you ever frequent that area, you know, you'll, you'll see mid-block, uh, there's, there's a, a, a lot of barriers to getting across the street. There's not very good mid-block crossings and the crossings at intersections are, are you know, pretty far between. And so I guess the question I've got is if, we're, if we are uh, rethinking that to be a mixed lane traffic uh, with no center um, median access for the bus lane, is there pl are there plans to work with SHA in order to improve the streetscape? So along uh, 3D5 where there are bus stops, you know, being able to um, have more pedestrian friendly ways to cross the street, for example, I think would be a priority um, in that area. And so I just wanted to hear, are there plans right now or, or in the future in order to have those discussions with, with the stakeholders? Um. So no concrete plans of anything uh, through conversations we've had with the state on changing the streetscape in that particular segment. Um, I guess what I will say is that we're open to those opportunities if the state is willing to entertain them and the city is, you know, uh, in, I guess in agreement as a stakeholder on that. What I can say is that the project is looking at numerous opportunities to improve safety along the corridor. Um, so at any location along the corridor where we currently have what are called free rights or slip rights, where the, the traffic doesn't have to come to kind of a traditional stop and make a 90 degree turn, but can kind of sweep through the intersection kind of via a, a slip ramp. We're looking at removing those at every intersection um, as part of our Vision Zero uh, efforts. Um, so that's not to say that every intersection will get that, um, but every intersection is being looked at critically to see, to, to see what can be done from a safety perspective to improve safety. And those are one of the things that we have identified that can definitely improve pedestrian safety at intersections. We're also upgrading all of the signalized intersections to have four leg crosswalks. So some intersections don't currently have all legs. Uh, striped with crosswalks. Some of that's for a particular reason. So it, maybe not every uh, intersection along the corridor will get four leg crosswalks, but that's a goal of ours is to try and get more striped crosswalks to again, raise the visibility to drivers, raise the visibility to pedestrians that this is a pedestrian space and they should be there. Um, in terms of where the stations are located, those will be located in locations that make sense from a crossing perspective and there'll be upgrades made to those. Um, we're also looking at bike and pedestrian enhancements along the corridor and throughout the corridor to facilitate better and safer access to the station. So um, it's a lot to get into and, and you know, happy to, to have you know, more detailed conversations with staff uh, at the city to, to kind of get into those details and that they can pass along to you all. And, and definitely, if you all have ideas, we're happy to consider those and see if they make sense to incorporate as part of the project or perhaps as part of another safety uh, program that the county has. Okay, yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, and it sounds good that, that you're at least thinking about that area. And I, I, I do commend the county on, on its uh, Vision Zero efforts, you know, it certainly, you know, I think makes a difference. Um, I, I certainly think that this area can can benefit from that kind of focus and, you know, being, being one vote on one of the stakeholders, it will be a priority of mine to, to make sure that we can do upgrades as we're um, bringing BRT in to, to not just to, to moving cars along, but also to making it safer for pedestrians and mixed modal transportation. Thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor, that was my only question. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, 
Mr. Mayor, can I yes, just please. add to that? Please. Uh, I just want to kind of amplify what uh, Council Member Wu was talking about. That particular section from Odin Hall down to Chestnut is um, about four tenths of a mile, and there are no signals in that space. And you will see currently lots of pedestrians trying to cross from one side to the other because there are no crosswalks. Uh, so I think what might be helpful, you know, in addition to that, the, the sidewalks themselves are relatively substandard. Um, having attempted to ride my bike down there, it's, it's a bit of a challenge as it stands. So if there are opportunities in this particular section uh, to improve pedestrian safety, bicyclist safety, uh, and perhaps, you know, add some uh, crossing opportunities there, obviously it is a state road, uh, I think the council would be pretty supportive of being able to make that a safer stretch. Okay. Uh, just to, as, as a matter of background, Rob Robinson, uh, we, uh, in terms of setting expectations here with the state, I, I think th these, are, these are good ideas and we'd love to see improvements. We have approached the state many times about that stretch of 355 and, and what's, what's been our success rate? It, it's very difficult and Corey can jump in and, and for the mayor and council member Spiegel and Harris, they may remember Corey was our lead consultant on our studies as we originally <laughs> looked uh, before he went to the county. Um, part of the issue with that section that council member McNulty was talking about, you know, on average, you know, most of the right of way more or less for 355 is 125 feet. That section is down to 95 feet. And part of the problem is we totally agree. It has substandard sidewalks. We have utility poles in the middle of it. So there's a lot of challenges there. The state's position, and Joanna and Corey can correct me, typically they don't begin changing stuff till somebody touches something. Um, so, you know, with going through mixed traffic, you know, we continue to advocate, but because of the constraints with that small amount of right of way, hence why the BRT itself is going in mixed traffic and not central because, again, we would be taking out most of the buildings. Uh, you know, all the buildings along that one section are very close. So um, not that anything is insurmountable, but there are definite engineering challenges and property challenges with, you know, potentially getting in, you know, even an eight-foot shared use path through that section. Um, so. I, I agree with Corey, you know, any opportunity we can explore, especially with our state partners with District 3 to try to get stuff. I mean, one going back um, in previous councils, you know, we'd even advocated for doing away with the bi-directional turn lane, center turn lane, um, just to try to get a constructed median there to potentially maybe, you know, shift some lanes and, and, and you know, get stuff working. I, I think a lot of it will come down as, as these folks move into 35%. And continue to analyze the impacts on traffic that may open up opportunities. If, if I'm wrong, um, you know there may be a chance to you know change the geometry maybe of the lanes themselves and get some additional within the existing right of way space. But but we've always said in the state. I mean one of the advantages, much as the county is adopting you know their vision zero aspects, the state is also going through a similar process. So hopefully, um, you know continue yeah. advocacy from our council and others on some of these state roads. Um, may begin to uh, affect change, but but the, you know the challenges, the overhead utilities, the three and a half foot wide sidewalks right on curb, you know property lanes, you know all of this stuff just compounds. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't give you a definitive answer about why you know A, B, or C why it hasn't occurred, but John, I just wanted to add that we are getting a new additional signalized intersection at Dalamar as part of the Megamart development mm -hmm. that will provide a pedestrian crossing which doesn't exist now between Chestnut and Noden Hall. That's which, an excellent point. Yeah. That's and great. a good improvement. That's good. Great. Good. Uh, okay. Uh, I am not really seeing members of the public in front of me, but there, uh, is there anybody on Zoom who'd like to testify? If so, uh, please use your Zoom raise hand function. Not seeing anybody raise their hands. Okay. Well, this has been... Uh, a good update, enlightening in many ways, and we look forward to uh, how this progresses, uh, both with uh, street improvements and with the with the Lake Forest property and the transit center. And you know, we feel like we're everybody's partners here. We we want to get the best optimal thing done for for our residents and and get some real transit in the city of Gaithersburg. It's it's exciting. So thank you guys very much. Thank you. And with that, I will note that we do not have a meeting, a work session next week on the 30th, um, which is uh, Memorial Day, of course.
the next regular meeting of the mayor and council will be on Monday, June 6th and 7.30 p.m. And you can participate in person or uh, over Zoom just like just like tonight. And until next time, oh, actually, b before I sign off, I will mention that we have um, two things coming up this weekend. Uh, Saturday at, at, at 11 a.m. there is the Flags for Our Heroes, which is not a city thing. It's, a, it's the Rotary Clubs do it in partnership with the city. Uh, where if you go by uh, Border Park, you will see an amazing display of American flags in honor of uh, people who've made the ultimate sacrifice uh, for our country. Um, and there, the dedication of that will be uh, Saturday at 11 a.m. And please join us there. And then uh, Monday, the 30th, I believe it's 11 a.m. Um, let me just look at my calendar real quick. It is 11 a.m. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we have our Memorial Day observance at Crispin Park on West Deer Park Road. Um, so uh, please join us at that. We'd love to have people join us. And, and with that, until next time, let's do great things, Gaithersburg. We are adjourned.